everybody. It's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. And it seems as if I always open up one of these with, I've got a treat for you today. I, at some point, it's going to be, become a ridiculous joke because I open them all that way. <laughs> but I want to frame this up because this is going to be so fun. I'm with Ernesto Pagano. He's a managing director and partner at Boston Consulting Group. Obviously, everybody knows one of the top consulting firms in the world, my favorite. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is we've got an inbound email from one of our listeners that's listened to hundreds of our episodes. And he said this, he said, Mo, I have learned so much listening to the former Sotheby CEO of 20 years, Bill Ruprecht, who is one of their top business getters, their word around relationships, or Jonathan Reckford, worldwide CEO of Habitat for Humanity, who's used our system to great success in developing deep relationships and major gifts and things like that. And the person said, I would like to meet somebody that's a little closer to my age, but just killing it when it comes to relationships, of adding value, of having tremendous impact. And Ernesto, when we saw each other at the Worldwide Officers Meeting and we just started talking, I'm like, you're the one, you're the one I want to talk to. And then we talked and we just had a great experience. So just love working with you. Welcome to the show. Oh, it's so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes. I think what everybody, I think what you're going to get is just some amazing insights from an amazing human being. Ernesto, when you think about a big idea that you want to share with the audience, roll with it, what would it be? Yes. So at BCG, my passion is growth for my clients, for BCG as a whole, for my teams and for myself. And that's when I spend most of my time with my clients. I do also other type of work. But very often, the first type of engagement we have with a client is around growth. Many CEOs call us and everybody wants to grow faster. Usually, we get the call and we help our clients in the journey. Yeah. And one of the things that I loved about working with you is, and I heard this from somebody else the other day, they said, our organization is in trouble when we clap for our success, a big contract signed or whatever. He said, I want us to clap for our client success. Mm -hmm. And Ernesto, you have that mindset. I've heard you with passion talk about the impact that you have with your clients. Tell me more. Yeah, first of all, very often you talk about each of us as a mission, as a passion, something that drives them at work. And last month I was on a business trip in Amsterdam and I was lucky that on the return trip, I was going back with my client. I was lucky and it was also something that I helped the uh, uh, make, <laughs> you made and, your own luck a little exactly. bit. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, the client asked me, uh, Ernesto, oh, you work so hard. It's such an intense job. Why do you do it? What drives you? And the, the first thing that came to mind for me was I love winning with my clients. And uh, I have a type of approach, which is when I work with a client, I only work with them. I don't work with the competitors. And that's something that is very important for me. And then I'm fully invested, fully embedded. And I consider myself part of the team. So for me, winning with our clients is key and we are behind them. They are the stars, but the learning, the experiences that we do together are phenomenal. I know you've also been very successful commercially in developing relationships and things like that. How do you convey that to clients? Yeah. The first thing that comes to mind more is care. I really care a lot for my clients, each of them. And that manifests itself in the fact that I do go above and beyond what they need us for. I am there when they need me. I really don't think of them as a just a commercial relationship. I think of them as people, as professionals with families, with personal hobbies and interests. And one of the things that I learned from your training, as you know, I went through your training multiple times, you know, because once it's not enough, I always need the refresher. So one of the things that I really love about the training is the concept of uncommon commonalities mm. and the mere exposure effect. And what I do there is I get to, I really invest time in learning about them as people, their family, their passions. And I'll give you another example. I was at a dinner a couple of years ago and I learned that a client had a passion for Formula One. Now I'm Italian and I grew up watching Formula One when the Ferrari and Schumacher were dominating. So that was like great memories for me with my dad watching the, the, the race on Sunday. But then the past 15 years, I've followed it. Then this client told me how much he was into it and how Drive to Survive was such a great show. So I was curious and open. I said, sure, let me watch the show. And I loved it. I'm all, now I'm following Formula One and basically every 
other Sunday when there is a race, I'm WhatsApping with him and we're commenting on, on the Formula One. And the same thing happened then with another client who's also into Formula One. And now basically we have this common passion that makes us human, make us like each other. So we're not just working together. We're also like sharing other experiences together. Now I'm a Ferrari fan. They are Red Bull fan and Aston Martin fan. So obviously there's also that fun aspect of on yeah. the rivalry. So I'm not saying that you need to love and enjoy everything your clients do, but I think yeah. having that uh, honest passion and being open to others' passions, I think it's, it's important. One of the mistakes I think I did when I was early in my career more was, oh, I'm Italian. I don't like football. I don't like baseball. I don't understand mm. it. I'm not going to get into it. And I think that was a mistake. I should have been more open to that. So nowadays I'm much more interested in my clients than I was. And that started when I heard the, a quote at the training, which really stuck with me, which was, if you want to be interesting, be interested. To mm. me, that was phenomenal because I always thought that I was supposed to be the one with the content, the ideas, the interesting things to say and so on. I realized that that's just the other way around. I need to be interested in my clients, in what they want, in what they like. And then I'm sure that we will have something in common that we both like. And that's a great opportunity to stay in touch and to build the relationship. These stories are so rich. And I want to double click on this, Ernesto, because I'm just seeing a trend out there that so many technical experts only want to cover the technical topics, you know, like talk about their awards, their accolades, their case studies, their client stories, all these things, but almost like wall things off into only talking about their technical expertise. Mm -hmm. You know, what you've heard us talk about the hireable things as opposed to the human things. And people can really resist that. It implies being a little vulnerable. It means asking questions you don't know the answer to. You've had so much success with relationships. How do you wade into that? Let's pick up, actually, let's pick up a really specific scenario. You're meeting somebody for the first time. And let's say you're having dinner. Like, how do you actually get into the human side of things? Yes, I would like to come back to where you started, though, about the importance of expertise and how I think about that, because I, I have something surprising to tell you, I think. Go. But uh, in terms of, uh, you asked about the dinner and how do I get into the human side of things. In my experience, more people love to talk. It's and really you, rare. I just need to say this, Ernesto. The way that you just leveraged curiosity. Ah, I did it. I've got something really <laughs> awesome to tell you, but we'll do that maybe later. Like I'm writing in red, in, which is, I usually write in blue and I'm like, but, come back to X. He's got something on expertise. I wonder okay. who told me about the importance <laughs> of curiosity. I wonder what that person was. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Like it worked on, I felt it working on me. <laughs> One of the things I noticed is that usually people love to talk including myself. And I've learned that the, one of the best qualities I can develop is to be a good listener. And I'm not naturally good at that, to be honest with you more. And I still have a lot to learn, hmm. to be clear. And I find myself in many situations where I actually tell myself in my mind, listen, don't interrupt, listen, don't jump in. Because that's my instinct. And I'm sure that this applies to many other people. So, and what I find is that when you let people talk, they usually lead the discussion towards topic that is, that are interesting to them. Some people want to go and talk about work. Then let's talk about work. Other people want to talk about uh, personal things or sports or whatever. So I really let the other person drive the discussion where we are at dinner, where we are in an informal uh, setting. To me, the key uh, element is be, ex be exposed to them, have the opportunity to engage in whatever is interesting to them, and then let them talk and be a good partner. Now, I'm not saying that you spend an hour without saying anything. Obviously, being present, having something to add, contribute your ideas, that's key. But I don't think you want to force the topics for discussion too much. Yeah. That to me is uh, a way to do it. And honestly, every time I go into a dinner, I don't have a set agenda to say, I want to talk about these three things. Obviously, I have some ideas of what with the discussion, where we might go, but I'm very flexible. I'm happy to go wherever it, the discussion goes. Yeah. What, well, you, you read our weekly article, Grow Big Playbook, um, which everybody can get at growbigplaybook.com. Shameless plug. Little article. It takes me about three hours every week to write something I hope somebody can read in about three minutes. And Ernesto, I just finished this Saturday's article like an hour or two ago. And one of the things I was realizing as I was writing about that, which is sort of this topic, is asking questions that the other side can choose 
Mm -hmm. if they want to go human or hireable, if they want to go business or personal. And I thought that was an interesting insight for me. So asking a question like, hey, what are your goals this year? Well, they could go either way. What are you excited about? They can go either way. Hey, what are you trying to remove? You could go either way. I mean, gosh, there's a million questions we could ask, but by purposefully leaving it quite a bit open-ended so that they can go into talk about business or they can go and talk about something in their personal life, you're not only helping them win at business if they want to cover that, you're helping them win at life if they want to talk about that and they can sort of guide. What's your thought around that? I absolutely agree. And I actually have a learning on this more. So very often I have some ideas for my clients and those are topics like, yep. And what I found is that when I go to my clients and tell them, Hey, have you heard about this brilliant idea? We should do it and we should help you. It never goes anywhere. And what I thought about it is that, you know, usually people love to buy either their own ideas or the ideas that I help co-create. So then yeah. my learning from them was, okay, maybe the right way to approach that is not to go straight to them and say, have you thought about Agile? And let me tell you the benefits and let me tell you why you should do it. And I'm the right person to do it for you. That doesn't work. So what, the reason why I think this is relevant for your point, Mo, is that I have some ideas, some topics I want to talk to them. And then I try to make sure that those topics fit into the discussion based Ooh. on where we're going. And usually when I have something back of my mind, there is always a way in which those thoughts uh, can fit. So for example, a client was just talking about how they are having challenges with growth, innovation, and the culture and so on. And we started to talk. And then at the right moment, I talked about Agile and how Agile can help companies innovate and so on. So I didn't go straight there and say, you should do Agile. I basically made sure that Agile was the right thing for them in the context of the discussion of where we were going. And I have always still like three to five ideas I want to talk to my clients about. The biggest challenge I have, Mo, is that I want to tell them about the five ideas right away. So I need to restrain myself to make sure that I have those three to five ideas and I have three to five meetings with my clients over time. And then I use the right idea at the right time. And it comes across, and it is much more natural and relevant for them. So as opposed to me going to them and imposing or sharing with them ideas that may or may not feel like relevant or appropriate, I really try to make sure that I have my ideas back of mind and I make them fit based on where the discussion is going. Yeah. One of the things you and I have talked about a little bit is the idea of using the client's priorities and their words as opposed yeah. to our priorities and our words. Because if you come out right out of the gate with agile, it sounds like jargon. It sounds like, yeah. oh, a hot hot consulting topic. I'm using air quotes, audio listeners. And it just can come across as being sold to as opposed to listening. Mm -hmm. But you, the way you just did it, you talked about hearing their priorities and their words. And then if agile, if agile tucks in underneath that, it makes it really natural to bring it up. So, so when you do bring it up, are you then like repeating back, hey, I heard you say X, Y, Z is a priority one thing we've seen that helps solve that yes. is Agile and thus, then you yes. roll. To, yeah, go deeper. That's one way to do it. Or very often what I do is we're doing this right now with this other client and I might, mm. I'm impressed by how well it works. Every time I say that, clients are very curious to know, why are you impressed? Why are you surprised? I do yeah. emphasize things that may inspire some emotions in things. I don't want to just tell, oh, this client is fantastic and they do Agile, you should copy them. I say, look, we're doing this right now. It's fantastic. I'm learning so much. And then they want to learn as well. And all, very often also what I do is this is what we're doing at BCG. So I can tell them it's not just something that somebody else is doing. We're doing it ourselves. And I do it Ooh. also on my teams. We experiment new things with my own team. And I share with clients what I'm doing because very often I'm facing similar situations. Sometimes not. But if I'm vulnerable and I'm very honest with my clients and I tell them, I'm struggling with that too. And this is how I'm handling it. What do you think? One of the things that I love to do is also seek advice and ask for help. And I learn so much from my clients. Mm -hmm. And it's a mutual uh, a beneficial relationship. I learn from them. Hopefully they learn from me. We share experiences. I don't go into relationships thinking that I am the uh, person that knows it all. Actually, I don't. Um, my job is to understand their priorities and bring to them what I think is the right solution, whatever that could be. There's so much. I'm writing in red all over the place, Ernesto. We're going to need two hours. We still <laughs> got to come back to the, your technical <laughs> comment, but I want to double click on full, being vulnerable because I just, so many people could look at you and say, oh my gosh, you're a managing director and partner at one of the most prestigious consulting firms in the world. Some of the smartest business people that 
we've ever met, right? Or at BCG. And so to hear the word vulnerable come out of your mouth, not be the person that always has the answers. There's somebody that was driving down a highway 30 seconds ago when you said that and their mind exploded. So tell us from your own experience, how can you be vulnerable and still have your, 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 your expertise showcased, if that makes sense. Like oh, you're, yeah, go. Well, I, I'm an extremely vulnerable person. I love to share uh, my feelings and my struggles, what's going through my mind with my team members, but also with clients. And I'll give you an example as of last week. So remember I was telling you that I, I have some ideas. I, I go to clients with ideas. And there was a specific client where I knew they needed help with digital marketing. I've been working with them for three years. I know them inside out. They really trust me. It's one of my strongest relationships. So it was the end of the year and I went to the CEO and said, okay, CEO, you know me, I know you. We have a trustful relationship. Digital marketing is something that we've been talking for a while. I think now is the time to do it. We need to do it. And I'm, because I really care about it, we're going to make sure that the commercial terms are better than usual because of some contextual reasons. So I was sure, Mo, sure that the CEO would say, Oh, Ernesto, thank you for coming with such a brilliant idea. Why don't you come tomorrow and do it? It didn't go like that. It was shocking to me. So what did I do? Two months later, I spoke with the chief of staff and they say, hey, I did this with the CEO and it didn't go anywhere. I was completely wrong. Like, what did I do wrong? What, what do you think? And I shared with her Ooh. what my thoughts were on what I did wrong. And I learned from the chief of staff on why the way I positioned it, why the approach didn't work, why it worked. The same thing applies to my team members. Uh, I'm very vulnerable where we're look, going after new opportunities and uh, how we're going after it. What are my, not frustrations, like concerns. Like, and uh, uh, sometimes I'm not the expert in a field. It doesn't mean that we cannot help the client. So I'm very open and vulnerable with my team members, but also uh, with clients. And very often when I start, I have a big client that I've been serving for many years and we, we work a lot with them. And every time I, I meet somebody new there, I always tell them, I'm probably not the expert for you on every topic. Actually, I know that I'm not going to be the expert on most of it. However, my role is to introduce you to the right expert. So by being vulnerable and transparent, first of all, I feel better because I'm being honest with my clients and I know they know what my role is. I know what my value add is. And also they feel good because it's okay. Ernesto is somebody honest. He will tell me when he is the expert and when he's not. And then as long as I keep bringing them the right expert, I think everything go well. So to me, it's actually been uh, such an unlock for me, Mo, because by being vulnerable, I don't need to stress all the time that I need to be the expert. And it lowers the bar for me to engage clients because I'm actually allowed to ask questions that if I were an expert, I couldn't ask the question. And yeah. I have the right to say, okay, I'm not an expert in this. Let me ask you these three questions. I get the context. So let me bring you the right person. I'm not that person. So for me, yeah. vulnerability helps with the relationships, help better understand the client needs because you don't need to look like you know it all. And also helps me be myself. I love to be able to be honest with my clients. Authenticity, which I've, from the moment we met years ago, I felt that ooze from you. And it's so cool for me to see all the success you've had by finding a way to do the work and win the work and do it authentically. It's really cool. I'm going to go totally off the reservation, Ernesto. I'm going to quote Brene Brown. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I'll butcher it a little bit, but I remember listening to her. My wife and I were driving somewhere, I think going to see some friends on vacations, people you know. And we were listening to this Brene Brown podcast because a, a friend had suggested to it. And roughly speaking, I'll get it wrong, I'm sure, but she said something like, vulnerability ends at the line where you don't convey your, your competence, meaning vulnerability, sharing that with your team. Like, I'm not sure I can lead the team. Probably not a good thing to share, <laughs> <laughs> but vulnerability around, I know we are going to achieve the right result together. We've got the technical expertise, we've got the right team, but questions around what's the order we should go through. When I think about business development, who else should be involved? How should I position this differently? Like in your example, like those kind of questions where you're saying, I know we can have the impact together we are meant to have, but saying that with certainty, but then asking questions around everything else around it, not it, if that makes sense. 
Yeah. What's your thought on that sort of, we could call it Brene Brown vulnerability or Brene Brown BD or something. Oh yeah. I have, yeah, go. I have several thoughts. The first one is that vulnerability actually helps you define what your value add is so that you Ooh, don't go deeper. Be, you don't have to be the only person that is needed at the client because we're not. So when I've been vulnerable, basically what they meant is that I was able to clarify to the client and to the team, my role and my value add. So for me, that was refreshing because I didn't have to fake anything. I knew what my role was. I know that I know X. I don't know why. Every time we need to do Y, I need to bring somebody else. And that's reflected in the actions, by the way, because I always tell my clients on every project we do together, I'm always going to be on those projects. However, there is always going to be somebody else who is the expert in the specific thing you need. So to me, that's one of the big uh, positive impact of being vulnerable is that you can define what you know, what you don't know, and you can own it for the client, for the team, for everybody. Two, I think it also shows that you have a low ego, which I think is important in our job. I don't like being arrogant. I don't like arrogant people. I'm, I consider myself a relatively humble person. And I believe in the power of teams. And I, I'll tell you another story from when I was promoted to my current role. I'll be honest with you, I was scared. Oh. Because this job is different from my prior one. My yeah. GPIs, my expectations, my day-by-day activities are very different. And I remember that when I stepped into the role, my assumption was, okay, now I need to go find clients. I need to find clients that want to hire me and I need to show them the value I bring. I thought that was very wrong. And I remember I was, I'm part of a, a small group of people that meet every month, uh, kind of a YPO similar, but not the same thing. Yep. And somebody told me is that you represent BCG. You don't represent just Ernesto Pagano. You represent BCG. And that was an unlock for me because that gave me the confidence more to go to every client with confidence and know that we can have that. That my job is to understand the need, be honest, transparent. If we can help them, bring the right people. And I, my job is to listen, understand what they really need. It's supposed to force a BTG product to them. No, it's to bring a solution to their problem. Understand their problem first and then figure it out. And I revert back a lot to my team. And I know that my team is amazing. I don't have to do it all. Actually, I don't do most of it. I do a small part of the value we deliver. So going back to vulnerability, it really allows me to understand that I am a team member, that there is a bigger team behind me, that there is a huge organization, fantastic organization behind me. And that's what we bring to client. It's not me. It's the power of BCG, the expertise of BCG, and the culture and the dynamics that we're able to build over time. That's the secret sauce. It's not me. Yep. Oh, this is so good. Well, I think it's a good time to tie back to that drop of curiosity that you dripped in a while back about expertise, something counterintuitive yeah. or unexpected. Yeah, go with it. Yeah. So this is the thing that I think will surprise you. I grew up uh, at BCG. I've been at BCG almost 15 years. And in my prior roles, I was always expected to be the expert. I was always the one so that had to know the content had to know the best practices, had to come up with the ideas, recommendations, and so on. Over time, in my new role, I have actually realized that that's not my job. I don't have an expectation for myself, and I don't set this expectation with my clients and with my teams that I am the expert. I lead with relationship. It doesn't mean that I don't bring expertise, but I don't have the expectation that I am the expert. In most cases, I'm not. The key thing for me has been to build the right team with the right expertise and being very thoughtful about how we pull people together, what is the strategy behind each of those people and as a team, what's the synergy around us working together. And and that to me has been really the most important uh, lever for uh, the commercial traction we, we got. And remember, you know better than me, in consulting, like in most professional services, it's difficult to scale. At the end of the day, our time is limited. We don't sell a product that it's an infinite people can buy and it doesn't take extra time. My time is limited. And the only way for me to scale is to have a team. And the more people I have in my team, the deeper expertise they have, the more complementarity we have, more we can. So that's to me being the thing that I had to change my mindset. 
it was very difficult for me, more extremely difficult to accept that in most cases, I will not be the smartest person in the room or the most expert in the room. It's extremely difficult, but I have to accept it. So a couple of years ago, I made the decision and say, I'm not going to try to be the expert in everything. I'm going to try to build the best team I can with the best experts in their field. Now, I'll tell you, it's very often it's uncomfortable more. I'm in meetings with clients and I'm not the one that is contributing the most. Initially, it was extremely uncomfortable. Now it's becoming something that I, I live with and I'm happy because it's my team and we're one thing. But I can see how that being a challenge and uh, it takes a different type of mindset, I think, in leading a team where you know you're not going to be the star. You know somebody else is going to shine and uh, going to be the person that is taking the lion's share of the airtime. And I think it's important to accept it and understand that that's the right thing to do. At least yeah. in some cases, at least for me, that's how I think about yeah. it. You know, this is super helpful. And I know there's just so many viewers and listeners right now taking note. So I want to go a bit deeper on this. Mm -hmm. And I think why this is so darn hard, you made the transition much faster than most, but I think the reason it's so hard is everything that got you there or got you to the point you're at when you get to that, that stage you're at is the, almost the exact opposite exactly. of what's going to make you successful in the future. And as we're, as you know, we're writing our next book and the manuscripts due in a couple months. And I've really been digging deep with our editor and publisher. And one of the things that I think is going to land in the first sort of introductory section and working title here, which I think is pretty clever, is what thought you hear won't get you there. Mm -hmm. So instead mm -hmm. of what got you here won't get you there, which is a classic Marshall Goldsmith, amazing book, what thought you hear, because it's all around mindset. And yes. maybe that will not, won't make it. Maybe it's too cheesy. But anyway, that's the idea. Oh, I like it. <laughs> okay, good. You have to say that because we're recording. <laughs> Best <laughs> captive audience. But one of the things I think that's going to be sort of the culmination of that introduction is a table. And in the table, without going into too much detail, there's like, here are the things that help you when you're an expert or when you're delivering the work. And then the second column of the table is here are the things that help you when you have to become a great at retention and growth. And when I put a draft of that together, Ernesto, it was even shocking to me that almost everything isn't a little bit different. They're complete opposites. They're exact opposites. Before you're built on, or you're not built, you're rewarded on getting the answer to every question and giving the answer. In business development, you're rewarded on persistence. A lot of times mm -hmm. people don't even write you back. They don't, they go dark, you know, they go cold, they go hot, things like that. There's a million other examples, but almost everything that, that got you to where you were when you made that transition is the opposite of what's need to be successful in the future. And that makes it double hard because A, they're the opposites and B, for most, it's really mysterious. It just feels like I keep doing the things that worked. Why don't they work now? So anyway, just your thoughts on that sort of vague concept. I totally agree, as I said, and uh, I'll tell you that even now still, uh, I think a lot about it because Mo, if I fast forward my career in three, four years, if Ooh. I do everything well, my team might not need me. Ooh. Think about it. If I do everything well, my team will not need me because I will have helped them build their expertise, build a book of business, and be good at business development. Yeah. So I think a lot about that in three years' time, four years' time. What's going to be my role? And the answer working answer I have. I love your thoughts on it, actually, because it's something as relevant as because I'm thinking about it now. I'm literally meeting with the head of the practice to, to share with that, to say, hey, just to be clear, this is what I'm doing. I'm pretty sure this is the right thing to do, but we agree that in three, five years, I'm not going to be relevant in these areas of the business. We're mm -hmm. all happy and I'm going to move on to the next thing. I'm taking a risk. I'm making myself vulnerable. I want to make sure we're on the same page because I want to do the right thing. So sharing it with the head of the practice with more experienced people makes me feel better because I know that others are supportive of it. We're all on the same page. I trust the people around me and I want to make sure that there is transparency on why I'm yeah. doing what I'm doing. And then the more, to be honest, I, I do find a lot of satisfaction and pleasure in seeing my team successful. Uh, yeah. You know, we have a joke. Uh, uh, this is a real one. We have a joke here. But basically, we say that they are the stars, I am the agent. 
And my job is to I love that. help them be successful. And when we work, I work for you, basically. I work for my team because my job is to understand their passions, understand what they're good, what they're good at, and when there is a need, and basically help them get there. And I really try to make myself irrelevant over time. And there is a level of trust and personal connection whereby I know that in three, four, five years, I'm still going to be working with them, hopefully still valuable to them and to my clients. But I do have the aspiration to make myself irrelevant and not need it to my team. I love that metaphor. I've never, you know, in my almost 20 years of running big, I've never heard it. So whenever you can give me something I'd never thought of before, it's a win for me. <laughs> but I love that because it's so true. It's so true. Let me run this past you. One of the frameworks that got cut on the path to publishing Snowball System is the idea of the major levels of somebody's service-based career. Level one. And I don't view these as sort of stair steps in a classic stair step diagram because they're cutting. You could also use like a ladder metaphor. You're climbing a ladder, mm -hmm. but, but, but let's just use level. So, so level one is you've got enough technical expertise. People can put you in front of clients and you can talk <laughs> level two. You can now lead client relationships on the delivery of work. So we're climbing up now. It's getting interesting. Now there's a team of people helping you do that typically, but you are leading to some kind of major impact, major, major outcome. The next level up in generic terms would be typically at most organizations, partner level, a little bit different words, BCG. But the idea here would be now I can win enough work to keep myself busy in these teams that are coming up. The next level up, how can I now learn new skills to teach other people to level up, to win enough work, to grow their own books of business and have the impact we, we want? As we get to the highest levels, it's how do I now help those people that are helping people win work, do business development at scale. That's where at this highest level, you've actually got to get really good in our vernacular of like scaling through give to gets, packaging up ways to meet new people, packaging up ways to invest in clients, packaging up systems that get large swaths of people doing outreach at clients when it's uncomfortable systems to teach people the skills that you and I are talking about today at scale. So as you move up, what's interesting about the metaphor is every time you take up a step, what used to work is not what works. And I think that's why we get such high flow through rates from moving up is we might have like a 10% success rate or something in a lot of organizations from making one level up to the next. It's really low, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I just love about you is that last story you told you basically went to your leadership and say, I'm going up to this next level. Is that the right thing? Because I want to go to the next level, but it means I'm going to leave some stuff behind. And you are actively engaging in those conversations internally to make it. That is like a one out of a thousand people that do that. So anyway, your thoughts on the framework, your, how to orchestrate it for others. Go. Well, I, I think the framework very relevant for professional services in general and specifically at BCG. That's how it works for us. And to be clear more, the reason why I did that is because I was uncomfortable. And I'm learning how to embrace being uncomfortable because growth comes with discomfort. And one way for me to manage it is what well, I'm a very honest, transparent person. I like to say what I think. I like to talk with others and share my feelings and see what they think. So really for me, there was what I did is not because I thought about the next level is to make sure that, hey, if we're on the same page, I'm doing the right thing. I'm not going to have any surprises in two, three years. Um, I do really generally seek the guidance. So when I talk to the head of the practice, I did say, hey, I'm also looking for your guidance. Is that the right thing yeah. to do? Give me your experience. And I think it's important to be open to feedback and to seek it. Many people say they're open to feedback, but I'm not, I don't see many people seeking it. The other thing that comes to mind more is the following. There is something that I really believe in, which is the best time to grow is when you don't need to grow. What do I mean by that? In my experience, it's important to be doing the things at the next level before you're even there. I tell my teams all the time, my managers say, if you want to become a partner, act like a partner. If you want to have a book of business in two years, start building a book of business now. It takes 10 years to build a 10-year relationship. 
the sooner you start, the sooner you will have a 10 year relationship. And it's not written in the job description of a manager. They're supposed to do these things. That's part of the job description in the next level. But to me, that doesn't mean anything. Start doing it earlier. And one of the best success stories in my team was somebody who was a consultant and I thought he was fantastic. And I had him be a manager one year into the job, even though he didn't have the title yet, because I said, you're ready for it. Just do it. And that's been one of the best success stories that I've seen. And I'm trying to replicate that on my own. So the, 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 another thing that I think is important is when things are going well and you're busy, that's when you have the confidence to take more risks, mm. the confidence to be vulnerable with others, because I can be vulnerable and things are going well. I know that I have a strong base, so I'm not really exposing huge weaknesses. Like, hey, I'm having a great year. By the way, these are some questions I have, some struggles. So what do you think? I think the level of confidence that you have and the type of discussion and the positive attitude, I think is very different. Very importantly also, you have the credibility internally to have those discussions there. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to wait for the three years to be here and be relevant and then start to have those discussions because then I'm in a tough situation. I want to have those discussions early when I'm doing well so that we are co-creating the plan together, me and the head of the practice. And we buy into what we help create, the IKEA effect. You taught me that. I think that applies with clients. It also applies internally. So creating the strategy with the people around you, I think is important. And, and the last thing I would say, this applies also with clients more. I think one of my struggles is that I spend too much time doing business development. And uh, sometimes business development is like marketing. You know, 50% of marketing works, 50% doesn't work. The only problem is that you don't know which one is the 50% that works. Yeah, I love I that. Business quote. development, to some extent, is the same. Yeah. I do so yeah. much business development. And I can tell you that very often the ROI is zero. I still do it because I love it. I learn and I, I also have a long-term perspective. So I, I know that it will pay off. But the easiest way for me to do business development is that when I'm engaging a client, I'm talking to the client. I know what's going on through their mind. So it's easier for me to expand the discussions when I'm talking to them, as opposed to having to do that three months, six months down the line, when it's a little bit more of a transaction cost to make it happen. So anyway, going back to my original point, the best time to grow is where you don't need to. So don't wait for things to be stuck for you to try to grow, but see, plant the seeds as you're growing. Yeah. Uh, audience, I'm talking to you, not Ernesto <laughs> right now. Go back and listen to this interview again, because this is one of those where we've got several of these Ernesto is, well, as you know, we've talked about it. We've got several interviews where people actually listen to it at a greater average rate than a hundred percent. Meaning the average person goes back and listens and rewinds. Oh, I'm one of those. <laughs> this is one of those. You, you there, there No, no, so I mean, I'm one of the listeners that have listened to some of your episodes more than once. Literally this yeah. morning, I listened to one that I listened a few months ago, just as as a refresher. So I'm one of those oh. that goes back to your episode. So that's what I meant. Yeah, no, I, I actually got it. But when I'm talking to the audience, like th this is one of those, Ernesto. I have a I have a strong feeling that there is so much rich content that you've delivered here that um, it, it's just worth listening to again. So let me do this. We've got these couple of questions at the end, and these yeah. are so good that we could run with these for a while. We've sort of covered questions one and two, which is sort yep. of the big idea and how to apply. We got, went really deep in application, both on an external and internal view, which I really love. So one and two are ticked. Third question, what is your personal system to keep learning? Yeah. So, and I know we are running out of time, so I'll try to keep this one short. So the first one and more that I haven't heard others do enough is I train others. And... Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that I did not expect. But when I was a manager, I remember I raised my hand to coach other consultants that just joined. And I remember doing it and saying, oh, wow, I learned more than the people that were listening to me. I learned from the questions. I learned from the practice I got. And it was a great refresher of what best practices are. So since I've been a manager, I said, you know, I want to do training. I want to train others because when I train others, I learn myself. So that to me is a big priority for how I learn. 
I retain much more of the lessons when I'm training as opposed to when I'm listening to somebody else. I do both, but uh, I, I, as you know, I'm a uh, religiously listen to your podcast. So for me, that's important. And once in a while, I flag the ones that I like the most and I go back to those because Ooh. I don't need to refresh it for myself. That's one. The second thing for me is I love yep. to talk to clients. Yes. I don't have any expectations that me reading the Wall Street Journal, I'm going to learn things that I can bring to clients. So what I do, I talk to clients and I deeply listen. I, I truly do. I restrain myself, as I said, by talking, from talking, because I say, I'm here to listen. And when I listen to clients, they tell me what the, what the trends are, what their worries are. And then what I do more is I go back to them with my thoughts. They didn't offer, they didn't ask for it, but I just do it because I think it's important. It establishes credibility. It shows that I care. And I'll give you an example. Yesterday, we started a new internal project on a topic, and this was a topic where we got an RFP from a client in January. The client had to put the project on hold until June. And I told the team, let's not wait until June. Let's just do it because it's such an interesting problem. Let's yeah. do it. We go to the client and we tell the client. And the team told me, but if we gave everything to the client, they're not going to hire us. That's not the point. The point is to have a relationship. The client understands we did it for them. The client, of course, is going to hire us. We just did the current initial work. They got has for sure. So this is something as of yesterday. And I would not know what the topic to learn is if mm. I did not talk to my client. And the other thing that I, I started to do, we didn't talk about it, but I think about my business as a business, right? So when I advise my clients on growth, I tell them you need to have your cash cow products. You need to have like adjacent products. And then you need to have longer term projects yep. that are going to be the fuel for growth in three, five years. I do the same thing for me. I grew up doing one thing. At some point in my career, I had to change and expand and go into something bigger. And then a few years ago, I started to plant seeds into a new industry, completely different from what I do. And for the first time last week or two weeks ago, I went to a conference related to this topic. And more, it was so uncomfortable. I didn't know anybody. I did not know the topic. I just showed up and it was fantastic. I learned a lot. They talk about the trends that are important in the industry. So if I have a conversation with a client, I know what's relevant. I joined some round tables. And again, I didn't know anybody. I was the least expert there. I was almost ashamed to introduce myself more. Okay. <laughs> so I still did it. But you know what happened that surprised me more? I now am in touch with the people at the round table. It was 10 of us all interested in the same topic. That small commonality, which is nothing, meant that we're now connected via email. And we are talking about that topic. And guess what? Yeah. We're doing an internal study on that topic because I know there are enough people out there that care about it. And this is a way for me to stay in touch. And then the third thing I would say around how do I keep learning is that I don't think about me. I think about my team. This is probably the most important thing I do. I cannot learn and stay up to speed on everything. I have a team of people. Each of them knows exactly what the area of expertise is. And I help them make sure that they stay in touch. But the key word to me is I make myself the weak link. I don't know if you heard that before. I am uh -huh. the weak link in the chain. I am the one that knows the least about any specific topic. I know enough to have smart conversations with clients, with my teams and be a top partner, but I don't know everything. My teams do. So I make myself the weak team, the weak link of the team to make sure that everybody knows how to stay up to speed and what they need to, to be doing. And I force them to do that. Basically, I tell my teams every month, we need to find something interesting and relevant for our clients. Each of you has an accountability. They know exactly what they're covering and they send me articles or IP or ideas and we send that to clients. Now, I don't do that. I don't have the time to do it. I didn't even, I wouldn't even know what the right things to send are, but my teams do. So my job is to coordinate and make sure that as a team, we keep learning. Oh, there's so much there. I want to have a whole other episode and all that. But the one thing I just wanted to say is our audience pay attention to what Ernesto is doing there when we were going up our metaphorical ladder or, or stair step. And so scaling a BD across a team is a big thing. Just that last little gem that you said that pro providing a way of a helpful way of your team understanding how to add value. And there's a little bit of accountability hook on a monthly basis brilliant. That's so much more powerful. You know, think of the 10X or maybe with back and forth in replies and meetings that you're not even in, maybe a 100X impact 
that you're having over the course of the year than if you try to carry that load yourself. Oh. I just think that's so powerful. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Fourth out of our fix, fix five questions. And of course, we got our little bonus spinner at the end. What lies, I'm so curious what your answer is going to be. When you see professionals out in the marketplace, what lies do you hear them tell themselves that get in the way of their own success? Well, number one that comes to mind more for professionals and for companies is that's not my core capability. <laughs> and that's something I've heard so many times when people are faced with a new idea, with a new opportunity. They say, yes, it makes sense, but I'm not good at it. Or that's not my identity. That's not my capability. So I'm not going to do it. And I think that's a big mistake. I know that obviously we want to focus on our strengths. We want to focus on our core capabilities, but two things. One is we do need to stretch ourselves. And what happens if our core capabilities become stale? We cannot stay stale. The most important thing is to adapt, is to evolve. It's not to say I have one core capability and that's all I do and that's all I want to do. And um, the other thing is also redefine what the capability is. Very often uh, professions, I think, define what they are good at very narrowly. And I see companies do the same thing. And most times when I work in companies more, I always tell my clients, one of the ways in which we add value is that we stretch you. We question your hypothesis. We question what you think are your identities so that you can rethink what, who you are and what you can do in a way that is aligned with the growth opportunities out there. And very often I tell my clients, don't make your identity become, a, don't be prisoner of your identity. Don't be prisoner of your Ooh. You want to build on those, you want to leverage those, but you want to expand. You don't want to just do the one thing you're good at. And obviously people are afraid of risking. They don't want to do changes hard. They don't want to do things they don't know how to do well. But to me, the number one lie is that's not my core skill. That's not my core capability. So, and then they don't do it. I think the other one is more, <laughs> that's very relevant for me is, oh, we don't have the right, we don't have enough time, enough resourcing or capabilities to do that. And, um, I face that all the time, even at BCG. There are so many things I would like to do. And, you know, BCG doesn't approve everything I want to do. So they don't give me the funding and so on. But I want to tell my team, every time we hear a no, that's an opportunity for us to find a different way to get to the same result. This is what innovation is. Innovation is when you have scarce resources and you still have to find a way to do something. So I'll give you an example. We're doing this new business as part of my team. I wanted to go to a conference. Initially, we didn't get approval for the full budget to go to the conference. And guess what? I found a way to make sure that there were clients there. So I was going there and I was going to meet my clients. And as I was there, I also went to the conference. So I don't take no for an answer. Like I've just find ways to get there within the boundaries of what's allowed, of course. And after I, I told the head of the practice, I was going to go there anyway. Guess what? I got the funding to go to the conference. So, you know, sometimes you need to force things a little bit, time, budget, resources. Uh, I, I don't think they are as much a constraint as people think. Yeah, well, there's so many cool stories around that. Okay, we still have a couple more. I'm so excited. The last formal question before our random yeah. one. How do you stay on track, including setbacks? Well, a uh, few things. One is that never think that success or failure, it's on me. I really think it's on the team. So when we win, when we learn, because we don't, we never lose. We either win or we learn. It's a team effort, so it's not about me. So my support system is very strong. And uh, it's very important to, to keep uh, our, um, to be, to stay humble and never think that uh, it's all about us in good, thing, in, in good times and in bad times. The other thing is that it's not personal. What we hear now from a client more, I really think that very often that's an opportunity to win a relationship. And that happened to me. So my biggest client right now, she told us no two years ago on a huge project. It was a big setback for me. And I remember when it happened, she said, hey, we're very happy with your work. We want to keep staying in touch. And I said, listen, we never worked together. I understand you chose somebody else for this project. You have an open credit with me. Anytime you need help, I will do a free project for you. No question asked, as long as it's important. Nine months later, she came and said, you remember that offer you made? Now I need your help. I, can you help? The answer is yes. And now that's my best client ever. Yes. And it started with a no. But I, I stayed to the course, committed. I invested in the relationship I had of, of it. And the key thing also more is that I really believe that you need to be there when they need you, not when it's convenient for you. 
Uh, I think that's important. Very often people go and make offers for free work or free IP, free whatever, and that's not the right time for the client. I like to make open offers to my client and say, I want to be the relationship with you. And even, especially after they give me a no. And I did that two weeks ago where I told somebody, we never work together. You pick somebody else for this. Give us a shot. It can be invested on us because we want to get to know you. And we're now in discussions and we will open up a new relationship like that. So no is not necessarily a bad thing. It's not a setback. It's just that you need to find a different way to get there. Yeah. Yeah, I just have to comment. And do you, will you have another minute or two to ask, answer this last question? Okay. I just have to comment on this because I think it's so important. A no can set up a future yes. And so many people don't wade into that uncomfortable middle when there's a no to ask for a DB call, to, to talk about who was chosen, to talk about what you could have done differently, to, to do the things I know you do. And you sort of skipped over how to orchestrate that conversation. But the most important thing is to actually have it because that helps you make the offer you did. The person remembers nine months later. Boy, people don't remember how you win. They remember how you lose. And you use that as a way to create maybe your, one of your most meaningful clients now. It's really cool. And I tell my clients that even if we hear no, we will show how much we care by investing in the relationship. So I stay in touch. Yep. Not that I forget. We lost it forever. No, we lost it for now. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Okay. All right, it is now time, audience, as I know you've been excited the about. The moment. The super powerful inspiration nudge, spin for short. I've got the little wheel right here. Ernesto, as you know well, this is so fun because I never know where it's go. And there's 10 of these, everybody, if you're on audio. So there's no way to know. The guests just can't prepare for all 10 things. No. So this is going to be off. All right, Ernesto, what is a personal ritual or habit that you think's most important to your future success, maybe within the realm of relationships and beauty? The ritual. Uh, my ritual is that um, there are two in the context of business development. One is that my assistant uh, books time with me, where basically she forces me to go through the proto list and come up with the actions I need to do. So we do yep. one hour every two weeks. And I realize that even if she puts a time on my calendar, I don't do it because there's always something that happens. So I need to improve on that. But basically, I asked her, can you please come in the room, be yeah. there, block an yeah. hour, and I'll do it with you. And this is important yeah. because that's so she goes through my thinking process and we do it together. Yeah. So that's a ritual that is working out very well for me. Uh, the second one is that uh, every time I'm on a long flight, uh, that's an opportunity for me to uh, think about business development, stay in touch with people and so on. So uh, again, my assistant is a great partner. She makes sure that I have a reminder with the Protomo list. It's there. So I clean it up. I do what I need to do. I use LinkedIn a lot. So my ritual is that every time I'm going to a long flight, I know that there's going to be a to-do for me that is business in it, business development related. Yeah. No, this is amazing. Wow. Ernesto, popping up a level. This has been amazing. I knew it was going to be good. I didn't know it'd be one of our best all time. I and mean, that's hard. I mean, that's a pretty high bar because we've had 500, 550, whatever it is. You just killed it there. I, I usually recap a couple learnings, but I have so many that I think I'm going to actually block some time off and write down some of the sayings you said, really deepen, really like memorize some of the stories you shared. It's just been fantastic. Way to go. I know you prepared a lot for this and you're going to make a big impact on the world. Thank you so much for being on the show. I love working with you. You're making a big difference. Keep it up. Thank you for the opportunity, Mo. You know how excited I was about this and you know how much I owe to you. So thank you for having me here. Awesome. Thank you.